So in The Trial of Chicago 7, I played Tom Hayden, who was an extraordinary man. Um, he was a young man born in Michigan. Um, he, was, he had a rebellious spirit from, the, from an early age. He joined the fledgling SDS uh, in the 60s, the Students for a Democratic Society, and he was one of the main authors of, of the Port Huron Statement, which was about, uh, about finding a new shift in, in, in liberal thought and politics, and, and it became um, pretty, pretty important. So I'm playing a man named Richard Schultz, who is an attorney on the prosecution side. Um, he's a real man who was the real prosecutor of this trial. Schultz is a character who I think it would say the American government is not flawless. It has a lot of flaws, but it's better than almost any of the other governments going. He's almost a kind of Lenny Bruce comic. Uh, he's funny, he's not actually a comedian, but he's using humor to, you know, get young people excited. And, um, you know, he really actually changed himself to become the most appealing thing to get young people motivated to end the war. So that's part of the reason why he grew his hair. He realized that if he was gonna get disaffected young people who, you know, look like hippies to actually go and protest the war, he should start to look like them. Growing up, I knew that uh, Bobby Seale was one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party. He's also very outspoken and open. I remember, I, I'm not sure if I've seen him uh, speak before, but it wouldn't be odd if I had. If I had, he does a lot of lectures, or he, or he used to do a lot of lectures um, at, at the colleges, Merritt College, uh, very likely at, at, at my high school or elementary schools at, at some point growing up. Um, and I know that he is a, a very uh, charismatic uh, figure and character, but also just a very important person in, in, in Oakland history and the community in history of, uh, of, of service. I'm Judge Julius Hoffman, a five foot six Jewish man. So it was absolutely right. He should get a six foot three Italian to play him. He was an unqualified, corrupt, feelingless man, at least in what he presented in the court. And he had no interest in listening or in any way abiding by the law. He came in there determined to get these men into prison, and he succeeded. Dave Dellinger was one of the seminal figures of the 20th century nonviolent protest movement in the United States. He was uh, a Yale grad, he went to Oxford, he was highly educated from a privileged class and chose to reject all of that and, uh, and get involved in nonviolent protests, both in terms of the civil rights movement and then later on the war movement. Jerry, in this story, really is, is, is the militant, in a sense, and he certainly was, you know. Jerry, Jerry started out in Berkeley, you know, laying down in front of the troop trains, stopping the troop trains going to Oakland. And, uh, and, 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 and Jerry was a real, you know, fiery radical. Uh, um, and, you know, Eldridge Cleaver, you know, these guys, you know, Jer Jerry was right there on the front lines with all of that. I play Rennie Davis. A uh, member of the SDS, um, very intelligent and interesting guy, uh, and uh, Tom Hayden's like right hand man in this in Aaron's story. Fred, um, he's he's basically here for Bobby throughout the film, but he you know in life he took over the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party at 17, and um, in this movie we, we see him at 21, so he's. He's fully, he's fully moving and, and grooving and doing, doing, the, doing, the, doing the work. And um, basically, you know, now that Bobby's on trial, he's here to kind of support him and, and just get him out and get justice for Bobby. One of the things I love about this film is it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't give answers really. Like the, 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 the world was not solved by. Um, by the resolution of how this this trial ended, and some of the major um, issues with our political systems remain um, uh, fragile and 
unworkable and or seemingly unworkable and, and at a moment in the world in which we're, we're, everyone is sort of standing there with, with bewilderment, the idea with, of, of continuing conversations seems, seems vital to me and, and that's what I love about what Aaron's done. I would hope that when people see the film uh, that some of the divisions that have become so entrenched in our society uh, have a light shown on them and there's reason to talk about them. It felt amazingly timely, the idea of justice hovering nearby but not actually <laughs> exerting itself and um, the purpose of the legal system and how, when it works and when it does not work. And obviously this is one of the great perversions of justice in you know, Amer modern American history. It's a story from, from 1968, but it's definitely one that's a story from every day in America since, since, since the first day of this trial um, up until right now. Um, you know, at the, at, at the table read, Aaron said that, you know, we're telling a story, it's, it's not a biopic, it's a story of an event from history, uh, but we want it to be relevant uh, for the audiences today, and, uh, and I think it should be. I think it should uh, encourage people to get out and to speak up and to really look at the state of our world, the state of our country, um, and to say that if we have a problem with something that we should speak up and we should speak out loudly. I hope people uh, start saying, Gee, this, we seem to have gone backwards uh, a, a little bit, have we? Well, how did we end up back in 1968 uh, uh, today? We don't want, want to do that again. Um, uh, st the nature of protest and the fact that when you protest your government, it doesn't mean you're anti-American. Um, uh, quite the opposite. It's a scene towards the end of the film when, when uh, Tom is being um, cross-examined by Kunstler. And there's a moment, um, and I, I asked him what his intention, or what I was meant to, how he wanted me to do that moment. And he said, hold on a minute. Let me take myself back to where, where I was when I wrote it. And it was this extraordinary thing. I've never had that access to a writer in which you saw him go into his head and, and, and be in that place of, of when he, where he was when he wrote that specific word. And that idea of that clarity is, is overwhelmed. But the other thing that's amazing is he, he just, he writes in, mus in a musical way and, and, and sometimes you see him by the monitor, he's not watching the monitor, he's literally just listening and he can hear instinctively when the, when, when the thing is jazzing, when it's, um, when it's, um, when it's riffing because, um, or, or, is one, uh, or when it's cooking <laughs> because, because he hears it in his ear and it, and it plays how he, he once imagined it. Yeah, Aaron is really about the writing. Um, and I appreciate that. He's, he, the way that he directs is actually rather hands off. He's like, uh, as long as you stick to the words, um, which why wouldn't you want to stick to the words? Uh, he's very much like you should do, I think what these words inspire you to do. So yeah, Mr. Sorkin is, and I'm saying, calling him that because I'm not sure whether it's Aaron or Aaron, um, is obviously a hugely intimidating force because he is probably the greatest living screenwriter. Uh, he's written so many brilliant movies and TV shows and plays. So he's definitely intimidating to be around. Um, but he's very playful, he knows exactly what he wants, he's amazingly enthusiastic, um, and very, very light, actually. So, yeah, it's been great. It's been great with him. Yeah, Aaron's very, very interesting uh, as a director. Aaron, uh, from my perspective, he lies heavily on his writing. You know, not to always bring Aaron, not, not to bring it back to his writing, but the writing is so strong. Uh, that as a director, he brings he brings the intelligence of what his vision is. You know, I think the best directors that I've worked with have always had a very strong uh, vision, very clear idea of what they want to execute. I think the other thing is that Aaron uh, cast the film incredibly well, so uh, he allowed a space for intelligent actors to bring to to meet 
an intelligent uh, script and then to bring that to life. You know, I think the director's job, uh, I think Aaron made it his job to make it as easy for us to, to, to tell the story as, as possible and, 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 and for him to be able to give us a playground to play and for him to step back. So I think between the combination of his uh, writing smarts, his, his, uh, his, his choice of casting and then trusting us you know, to, to, to go in and play, I think it gave us a lot of, a lot of the freedom and structure to, to succeed. Do you walk uh, past the Hilton Hotel where Hubert Humphrey looked down on Grant Park to where the protesters were being gassed? The tear gas was floating up to his open window while he was receiving the nomination for the presidency, uh, the Democratic uh, nomination for the presidency. That's so amazing to be able to work in those places. It would be like uh, shooting a scene uh, for the French Revolution at the Bastille. You don't have to pretend at all. You feel the energy and you know the topography. You, you feel the energy and you know the topography. You can see it and feel it and why it unfolded the way it did. It's uh, absolutely uh, vital to the truth of the film. That was a great and very powerful way to start filming. We started there in, in, uh, in uh, I forget what month it is, sometime in October. Uh, and you know, they, they, had, they had negotiated a deal for us all to stay at this place called the Palmer House, which was when I saw that in the email, you know, that's where Judge Julie lived, and it's where the entire jury was impaneled during the trial. So it kind of started off immediately, right off the bat, in a his, sort of historical, uh, you know, a, a way. Everybody was demonstrating, both in Lincoln Park, which is about three miles north of the Hilton, the, the, the actual delegates, all the delegates were staying at the Hilton. The Hilton was sort of the de facto headquarters of the, of the Democratic Convention. And there's a park right across the street from the Hilton called Grant Park. And that's where this statue is. It's, uh, I think, a, 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 a Union General, General Logan. Grant Park uh, um, looks exactly like Grant Park, as you'd imagine. And it was everything we needed. It's the perfect rectangle right on Michigan Avenue. The perimeters are clear. The audience can see. Because every scene that takes place in the park, and there aren't many of them. I know you're going to ask me about the fact that most of it's a courtroom drama. Um, uh, but you know, it, it, every scene that takes place in the park is about getting out of the park. In a democracy, citizens, we've uh, uh, we, we, we've dressed certain people in a lot of power. We have uh, invested them uh, with that power. And the, the, the way to change things, uh, if, if you can't change things through elections, uh, you have to express your disgust, you have to express your pain, um, uh, and you have to go out on the streets. You have to disrupt things. You don't have to be violent. You don't have to burn things down. Um, but you have to uh, show leaders that the people who put them there are unhappy uh, and they need to pay attention. I can't think of any meaningful change that's happened in this country or anywhere else that wasn't preceded by robust protest. The one note that I gave everybody at the beginning and then every day after that was don't lean into 60s iconography. Uh, uh, don't lean into the tie-dye peace sign uh, uh, psychedelic aesthetic uh, because this movie is not about 1968, it's about today. And I want to put as little as possible uh, between the movie and today's audience. You know, I've been asked if I changed uh, the screenplay or the film at all uh, to mirror events uh, in this country. No, uh, events in this country changed to mirror the script uh, in chilling ways, in ways that we never imagined. Uh, I thought that the film was relevant while we were making it. We didn't need it to get more relevant. All these things that uh, you'd hear in 1968 that I saw, you know, written on signs and, and photographs from the time. Uh, like I said, we didn't need it to get more relevant, but with the murder of Breonna Taylor and uh, George Floyd uh, and others, uh, 
um, began to be so much like the murder of Fred Hampton uh, in the middle of the trial. And then finally, uh, the clashes between protesters and police uh, on the street, these tear gas uh, and batons. Uh, there were times when watching CNN's coverage uh, of, of those clashes between protesters and police, I thought, you know, if you just degraded the color on that a little bit, it would look exactly like uh, the, the file footage we used from 1968.